Bradley of LaCroix to call for help. May I help you? Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Welcome. It's time for call for help. Yeah, get Grandma downstairs. Wake up, Grandma! Everybody, on the couch right now. Ha, ha, ha. Hurry up. We're not going to hold this show for very long. We can't keep it going. All right. Everybody there? Okay. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. This is the show where we help you understand and use technology. Everything from computers to gadgets to gizmos, anything you need to understand better, that's where we come in. Now, I can't do it alone. Mm -mm. <laughs> I learned long ago that really I need other people to actually do the work. That would be Amber <laughs> MacArthur and Andy Walker, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Leo. Hello. What did you eat for lunch? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Turbot. 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 Is that what turbot does to people like you? Well, turbo turbot does. Turbot. Yes. <laughs> what are you going to You're going to be doing a, you said a wiki? Yeah, and um, we're actually going to show people how to create a wiki. What's a wiki? A wiki is basically a website where anyone can, <laughs> and a website that anyone can edit, like Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So anyone can go in and edit the wiki and make changes, and it's not right. that dance. And he's doing the wiki dance. <laughs> it's not that. We'll show you, so it wiki, should be kind wiki, of fun. Wiki. <laughs> That's a very attractive yeah. answer. Yeah, we need to teach them something. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, you're going to talk about uh, zooming text? Yeah, my dad has this uh, condition, which actually affects many, very, many, many people, called macular degeneration. Mm, yes. So In fact, I have a friend who has uh, macular degeneration. Do you? Yeah. Well, it, cr it creates basically black spots in the middle of your vision. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to show you a really cool piece of software that my dad actually has changed my dad's life. It allows him to work, even though he has this condition. And he actually runs my cyberwalker.com and he wow. runs my mom's business and that sort of thing. So. I need to find out about this. My friend, he puts his text on his computer this big, and this sounds like something that will help him a lot. Absolutely. Okay, good. Cool. That'll be good. Eric Rice is back. You yep. may remember him. We talked a little bit about audio blogging. He's one of the kings of the blogging community and the audio blogging community, and he's really one of the foremost creators of video blogging. Yeah, it's the next thing. Uh, we'll talk about how you could put your own video on the uh, internet and let other people see it and subscribe to it. That's coming up on the show. This is a picture I love that was that sent picture. in to us from Anthony in Minneapolis. He found call for help. Looks like it's a mall. Yeah, he was in a mall on his way to see the Daytona 500. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How so fun. he saw the sign, took a picture. I love it. That should be our new logo. I know. <laughs> I like it. Call for help. Call for help. Now we're on our new set again. Well, I wonder where we put pictures on our new set. We have to find a place. We're actually hmm. going to put them on the magnet board back there eventually. So we'll get little pieces of magnet and then we'll put them all up there. So we'll be filled with lots of photos. <laughs> like our names are on. Those are magnets, right? The yeah, names? Yeah. It's all So magnets. they can easily remove them. <laughs> that's so look at that's this. how I feel. Look at this. If they, if they say, ah, oh, this Leo guy's not working out, eh, you just take him off. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, just, you know, take the name. That's pretty funny. Look at that. That's very cool. Ah, that's right. Nice. Careful of your, I don't know, any kind of magnetic media. <laughs> Next time I go to a uh, hard drive. Yeah, no computer kidding. conference, I'm going to wear this up. <laughs> Hi, my name is Leo. Hi, my name is Leo. Hey, do we have a uh, caller for the uh, show today? Yeah, we do. We have up? Darren on the line from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Well, let's say hello to Darren. Hello, Darren. Hello. How are you? Welcome I'm, to the show. I'm doing good. How are you? I've got to put my name back on the wall. So uh, say hello to Basil, ladies and gentlemen. Camera number two. We couldn't do it without him. He's one. It shows how much I know. <laughs> what can I do for you, Darren? Um, I'm just wondering the telltale signs of a fried video card. Of a fried video card. Well, I would first, I would sniff it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you laugh, but it, sometimes you, you can smell something that's burned. I know Patrick Norton, when I used to do the screensavers, we actually fried a couple of chips. And you can tell, not only will there be scorch marks, but there's a little s smoky flavor to it. Okay. But that's probably not. Why do you think your video card's fried? Uh, well, what happens when I, I play certain games, like um, it'll go for, it seems like a random amount of time, maybe 10 minutes to maybe an hour. Yeah. And then it'll just freeze up okay. for about maybe 20 seconds. Then it will start playing again. Like the, the video will freeze, but the audio will keep going. When the video comes back, um, it actually looks like there's holes in the textures. Like you can see wow. through them and stuff. That's not good. Yeah. Does it only happen on games? Um, yes. No, it doesn't happen in like any application. Any other time. Games. Okay. A um, couple of thoughts along that line. First of all, it sounds like it's overheating. Okay. So uh, you notice this card has a heat sink on it, but this is an older card now. And the more, what kind of card is it? Uh, NVIDIA GeForce 5600. Yeah, that should have a sink and a fan. Do you yeah, have a it fan? has a fan on yeah. it. Yeah. 
So, and I would check and make sure that fan's blowing air, that there's, there's nothing obstructing it. You don't have IDE cables or something in the way, that there's good airflow through your system. Because um, if it's overheating, which is what it sounds like, that's, that's the symptom that you'd probably see. Yeah. The other possibility is that your video RAM, you've got some bad video RAM. The reason I asked if it only happens in games, twofold. First of all, games do tax the card more than anything else. Yeah. But also, they are, the, you know, very few applications actually use video RAM or use much video RAM, uh, except for games. When you said you see holes in the game, that yeah. sounds like to me the memory, there's errors in the memory. Okay. So, um, you know, what do you do? I, it's kind of a hard thing to test. I mean, I guess... Uh, there's so many interactions in this. It could also be a driver. I guess you could try the card in another, per, you know, friend's system, and yeah. if you get in the same issues, then that then it's definitely the card. You might want to try another driver, update the driver. Um, you also should run DX Diag. Do you know about that? The diagnostics for di uh, uh, DirectX. No. Okay, because it could be this. It could be those as well. So what we do is we click uh, Start, Run, and type DX Diag. This is the DirectX diagnostic tool All right. and it comes with DirectX. DirectX is Microsoft's uh, library of, of tools uh, and utilities and software for video and, uh, and it's used heavily in gaming. So uh, this is a way to actually kind of test the card uh, uh, and I think probably even do some diagnostics on it. You'll see once we're in here we can actually run through the tests on here and uh, see if there's an issue and it will test not only the hardware but also the software. So. I would recommend going through these diagnostics to make sure that you're okay. All right. Um, but yeah, it's not, you know, how do you tell if the card's fried? Well, it's not working right. Yeah, yeah that's what I figured. <laughs> but whether it's fried or the software is fried, it's hard to tell. Uh, it does to me. It sounds like overheating, so I would definitely look at cooling. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, a video driver can cause all sorts of weird problems as well. Yeah. If you reboot or, or restart the game, is everything okay for another hour? Or does well, it, it, yeah, for another random amount of time. Random long amount takes, of time. Right? Okay. Well, if it's overheating, then it should happen pretty quickly, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does. you'll be surprised how fast chips cool down. You give them 30 seconds to a minute, they're often, you know, they drop very, very rapidly in temperature. But it should heat up again pretty quickly. So if it's a heating problem, then restarting the machine or restarting the game won't fix it. If it's a driver problem, it will. Okay, At yeah, I fiddled around with the drivers a bunch. I rolled them back and got the newest oh, ones, okay. and it still didn't fix anything. Yeah, so. sounds like it's the card. Yeah, that's what I, I figured. To, hey, how long have you had it? Um, not too long, maybe a year and a half. Oh, so yeah, it's out of warranty. That, uh, you know, it's kind of annoying when it breaks. Yeah, it's out of warranty. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that's, the, that's funny because these things don't usually fail. If they last the first six months... Yeah, they should be good forever. They should be good forever, right? What's going to go wrong? There's no moving parts. Do you got any thoughts, Andy, on what could be... It sounds to me like, a, like maybe... Um, he wants to work on the cooling, like the cooling stopped working very well. Yeah, that could be it. Um, look, look and see if that fan's turning when it's uh, on. I oh, yeah, wonder... yeah. I opened it up already. Oh, all checked. the fans are oh, okay. all moving and everything's clear. Okay. i got to wonder if there's a possible driver update that, or a... a well, he says he's tried all the tried, to, tried the driver update, have you? Yeah. Darren? Yeah. He's yeah. rolled back, rolled mm -hmm. forward, inside, outside, um, upside, yeah. down. Well, yeah. I would kind of go with your diagnosis then. Sounds like a heat problem. Yeah. It shouldn't fail if it works for six months, but sometimes if something's heating up more than it used to, it will cause a failure. All right. Those are some things to try. Right on. Hey, thanks, Darren. Thanks a lot. What's your favorite game? Uh, my favorite game right now is uh, World of Warcraft. Yeah, that's yeah, the like online Warcraft. Oh, boy, is that fun. <laughs> how, give us honest. How many hours a day? Um, too many. Yeah. <laughs> that's honest. Hey, thanks for the call, Darren. I appreciate it. Yeah, take it easy. It. All right, bye-bye. Right. I don't start playing those games because I know I love Warcraft anyway. I'd start playing that, you'd never see me again. From your average Joe, citizen-style news reporting to first-person storytelling, there are many styles of video broadcasts online. It's a new field, though, and uh, if you're interested in getting into it, we've got somebody who knows more than anybody else. Eric Rice is here to teach you how to produce and watch video blogs. Yes, it's new, it's hot, it's happening, and it's up next. Stay right here. This is where I keep all my, uh, you know, vegetables for... Hi, welcome back to Call for Help. Our guest today says he's an advocate for personal micro-content broadcasting. We call that PMCB. 
I don't know what it means either. Joining us now, Eric Rice, who believes you can star in and make your own television show or movie without the need for a Hollywood budget or even a call for help budget. He's here, <laughs> which believe me, is not much more than his budget. He's here with some tips on becoming an online broadcaster. Welcome back, Eric. It's good Thank to you. have you. Thank you. So uh, you started by doing a blog. In fact, you were doing a website that was essentially a blog right. 10 in, years ago almost. Yeah, in yeah. the pre-blog era. Yeah. What is, what is that? What is a blog? Just, uh, let's start at the beginning so people can understand what we're talking about here. Well, it's, uh, some people will compare it to a personal website, but instead of having to be really technical or knowing somebody that is, you can just go ahead and log in yourself, update a title, a body, and you put it out there. People can comment on it, and then a blog entry can be aware that other people are, are linking to it. And so what happens is that conversation starts, and it's much faster than building a website of a long time ago. It has, it's, it's really just a tool that lets you do this. But yeah, it can be anything from a personal diary to a political or a technology blog. People, I mean, even journalism is really happening. Mm -hmm. even now. Journalists are, are also blogging. So originally blogs were just text. Yeah, you could say that. Uh, you kind of, uh, among others, helped add audio to it mm -hmm. with audioblog.com, mm -hmm. but now you're doing video. Yeah, we are. Tell us about that. Well, it's uh, actually two ways that you can record and publish audio and post it to your blog. One is through a webcam that you'd have attached to your computer. Okay. Uh, and then the other is uploading video. Okay. So if you... Why would, first of all, uh, step back, why? <laughs> well... <laughs> why would you want to do this? We've, we've actually been living with camcorders for quite some time. Yeah. And we capture things like picnics and we birthday parties. We have a lot party. of video now. Yeah, there's yeah. lots of video. I, I've actually found video that I was shooting from years ago. I was essentially video blogging. I just didn't have anything to do with it. Nobody could read it or see it. Yeah. You'd have to invite people over and bore them in person. But now you can bore them. Now the, I can uh, bore the world. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, you said another thing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, uh, actually quote you. You said that you were watching tech TV, and you said, I can do that. <laughs> I, mean, I can do that. Certainly. It's, it's, just, it's taking the camera and turning it around and I like it. pointing it at yourself. I've always said that there's no reason, you know, th there's the old A.J. Liebling quote, freedom of the press belongs to the guy who owns one. Mm. But everybody now can own a printing press. Everyone now can own a radio station or a television station. Webcams are real cheap. Yeah, the yeah. network makes it possible. So uh, this is, now are you doing this through audioblog.com or is this how do you do it? Well, uh, actually, what I did, I published a video to my own blog earlier today. Okay. Let's, uh, uh, we should show it because it's a little behind the scenes from yeah, our, from our uh, TV show. Actually, yeah. I think Mikey is on this. And so you sit there, and there's Mikey. Hey, Hi, Mikey. Very nice. Hi, Mikey. And then, there, there you go. Gotcha. And then the new test. It, it doesn't producer. zoom. It gives you a little bit of a digital zoom because the motor will make noise. So yeah. you're using a cam your, uh, I'm still using, camera to do this. Using this camera. Uh, and this is just a... Uh, digital still camera made by Canon. Actually. Almost all of them now have. They take little video clips on it. And it's got a movie mode, and all I need to do is essentially do the traditional video blogger arm length. Right. You know, and I point it at myself. Is that kind of a standard now in video blogging? Is the arm length video? Blog? Yeah. So <laughs> I can go ahead and hold it out. Mo blogs. There are a lot of mo blog. Mo, mo blogs, of course, mobile phone camera right. blogging. And a lot of that is like out here. So the AVI file that's being recorded on this right now. Oh, you're doing it now? Yeah, I'm doing it right now. Oh boy. So say there you go. Hey, All smile right. everybody, you're on, a, you're on a video blog. There you go. And what it's doing is it's saved an API file, and there's a secure digital card in here. You just pop that card out. Pop it into okay. my card reader, and I upload directly from here to audioblog.com. Now, some cameras record MJPEG, some cameras record QuickTime movies, some AVI, does it matter? It, well, currently we support AVI. We'll be AVI only. We'll, okay. Right, we'll be supporting mobile video formats, we'll be supporting MPEG okay. and such. And it's not just taking it and uploading it directly. You can take it into a program like iMovie on the Mac right. or Movie Maker on the PC. And edit it? Edit it together and create something even bigger than that. That sounds like something that's even more exciting because it gives people the chance to actually create TV shows or films or short films mm -hmm. and really do something creative more than just kind of the here's some here's a picture of where I am right now. Yeah, there's lots of genres of what people are doing with uh, with video. Is there a lot of this? Yeah. Oh, there's yeah, it's growing really? quickly. It's it's kind of it's using the same technology that podcasting is using to deliver. If you have an aggregator, if you have something like Ant or you use a web-based aggregator like Mefedia, you can subscribe to video blog feeds just as you would subscribe to a podcast feed. So let me translate this for uh, the technologically impaired. Mm. Um, <laughs> you can subscribe to a blog's video feed and it will automatically get delivered to you in the same way the text or the audio would Absolutely. be from the blog. Absolutely. And uh, it would be copied to your 
desktop, and then you could look at it. You could look at it. You could burn it to disc. You could make a DVD out of it. Or if you have a portable media center, like the PlayStation Portable, you can watch video so on. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. So now you can take it. Now you can take it with you. Yeah. I mean, I'm uh, as podcasters, you and I both are doing mm -hmm. ra essentially what is radio shows that are delivered to people, which they then mm -hmm. listen to on their portable MP3 player. If more and more people have portable me video players, you could do television. Essentially, yeah, you could yeah. do it on location. And what yeah. people are doing, some people are creating little art shorts, art uh -huh. films. Some people are doing reporting. There's a very popular video blog, Rocket Boom. They just went out and covered the Boston Marathon a little How, while ago. Do I have to have a website to do this? Uh, there are many free websites that you can use to host. Can you use um, blogger.com or audioblog.com? A lot of people blog. use bloggers, um, uh, blogger.com. Others, you, you'll be able to do it directly through Audioblog, so you publish it. Uh, we're get real excited about mobile. Is this video. something you've already started on uh, AudioBlog? Yeah, it's it's in it's in beta right now, but it's okay. available to our current customers right so now. So okay, AudioBlog.com, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you're offering right now a free trial. I think yeah, we have right. a free trial. Okay, um, so you would upload it to your blog, and then AudioBlog would handle the process of making it visible. Do you have a player? It would post it. Yeah, it would actually post uh, just like the player we were watching a little behind the scenes. So, so that's the nice thing. If, you, yeah. if you're running some other uh, blogging software, you might not have this kind of ease of use. Like WordPress or oh, it, this should this should work with all of the major oh, really? blogging oh, programs. Okay. Yeah. So you provide a back end that will work with the back. With yeah, the we're back essentially end. hosting it and allowing a nice player to be published. Yeah, that's well. another issue. Briefly. This can take up a lot of bandwidth. Should people start to be concerned about that? Because I mean, uh, a lot of if videos, you're paying by the bit, you're going to be paying. Yeah. A lot of videos are showing up uh, 320 by 240, you know, a smaller size. Okay. Uh, as bandwidth and compression technologies get better, we're going to start seeing a lot more of uh, a bigger video or people start doing more widescreen. It's bandwidth is the big thing always. Well, but that's another reason to use someone like video, uh, like Blogger or AudioBlog.com because mm -hmm. you guys basically yeah, we absorb do the compress. bandwidth costs right. and you do the compression. Google just announced that they're going to start hosting people's videos for free. So I think that more and more it'll be possible to put mm -hmm. up video and not worry about it. So it's like our media too. Our media, which, which you showed as a free file a couple of days ago. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. So, a lot of fun. People want to know more about this, go to ericrice.com. He's the host of the Eric Rice Show and the Engadget podcast, of course, where uh, Eric talks about a lot of uh, digital media topics. You can also see him uh, at uh, audioblog.com mm -hmm. and uh, in our show notes, all about video blogging and audio blogging tool at callforhelptv.com. Thank you, Eric. Always Appreciate it. Coming up, we'd like to, uh, well actually let's do it right now, let's give you a chance to take our daily tech quiz, see how smart you are. You ready? What kind of television device, device can be damaged from burn-in? LCD, CRT, plasma, or an Etch-a-Sketch? I think uh, two out of these four can be damaged by burn-in. Oh wow, mm, we'll talk about it in just a little bit when Call for Help continues, stay right here. Welcome back to Call for Help. Time for our Mac tip of the day. Do you want to know how to change the default application for a certain type of file? All you have to do is click on that file. Here we're going to click on a Word document. Click Command I. And then you'll get a little window that opens up. And you can choose to open this document with different types of applications. So we'll click Text Edit. And then we could change the default application for all these types of files. Now we have another call. We have a webcam call. It's Ron from Medicine Hat, Alberta. Hello. How are you? Thank you, Amber. Hi, Leo. How are, how are things in Medicine Hat? They're great. Good. Spring has sprung. Oh, yeah. It's gorgeous here. I feel bad because just as we're starting to get some nice weather, our friends in Australia who also watch this show are heading straight in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> you can't win. It's, it's, you know. So what can I do for you today, my friend? Well, I was wondering about net meeting okay. and running it through a router. Oh, yeah. That's always issue, an issue. Yeah, um, what I had to do, I've actually partially solved the problem. Okay. Is I use a SMC router. Okay. And I had to manually open all the ports That's that right. that meeting uses. You have to port what's called port forward. That's right. Right. And I was wondering if there was another way to do it. No. <laughs> That's what you do. So now let me talk a little bit about what all this is, because this is actually relevant to anybody who's using a firewall or a router. Uh, because a that's what a router does, basically. Um, anytime you're using a non-standard internet protocol like video conferencing, now this is a router here. A router, what a router does is it takes your internet access 
and a cable modem or a DSL modem hooks up into yeah. here. And then it allows multiple systems, in this case both wirelessly and wired, to use that internet access. So it's literally routing traffic that comes in here to these ports and vice versa. So when a computer on this port, for instance, wants to talk to a web page, it goes through the router. The router establishes the conversation. And then when traffic comes back from that web page, it knows to send it to that computer. It's routing. So routers are, and firewalls too, are, are generally configured when they come out of the box to work with common network protocols like HTTP, the web protocol, right. um, email protocols, things like that. But as soon as you start going beyond that to things like video conferencing, then you have to instruct the router. The router already has some ports that are forwarded. Port 80 is forwarded because it is, uh, you know, a, a web port. You couldn't, you, what good would a router be if you couldn't get on the web? Yeah. So you figured it out already. I don't have to tell you that in order, there are, by the way, NetMeeting uses half a dozen different ports. Yeah, so, they've got six open right yeah. now. Yeah, so you have to go in there and say to the router, okay. Now, it doesn't, it's not as unsafe as it sounds, but you have to say to the router, okay, these ports, when traffic comes in on these ports, it doesn't make it accessible to, to the, all of the computers on the network. That's the difference between it and, say, HTTP. It yeah. only is sent to one computer on the network, or as many as you specifically, explicitly say. Right. So uh, Microsoft details this for NetMeeting in, um, in their net meeting, on their NetMeeting site, and they say there's Chapter 4, Firewall Configuration, and here's the ports that you have to open, 389, 522. Incidentally, you probably, were you able to make calls but not receive calls? I, I could make calls, but I couldn't receive them. Yeah, now does that, make, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because right. what happened there is the router, once the conversation was established, didn't need to be told where to send that traffic to because you established it. The problem is that incoming call, the router doesn't know anything about, and it actually drops the packets. It says, and yeah. that's why a router is an effective firewall. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Because it, it works it, really well, actually. Yeah, because it drops packets that aren't expected. Right. So an un incoming expected packet, uh, unexpected packet, like a net meeting packet, go the router goes, nah, -uh, no way you're getting in, dude. So you figured this out. What you do is you load the router's interface. Here's a Linksys interface. And in this particular one, it looks different on every uh, piece of hardware. But in this one, we actually click on the applications and gaming. And this is port range forwarding. And you would just, you know, this is for your purposes. You just type in net meeting. But you could do anything you want in here. And then you'll have to say which ports. So we're going to go back here and we're going to say, OK, port 389 using the TC. You have port and protocol, the TCP protocol. There's two. So we're going to say port 389. And we're going to say using TCP. When that comes in, I want you to forward that to whatever. Now, in order to do this, you need to know the IP address of the computer you're sending it to. Right. And which, then, which I just did it for my network. I yeah, think, you could network. do it network-wide as well. Uh, that's a little less secure, because, but, but not, a, not a huge chance. I've only got three computers on here. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a big deal. My, uh, Andy, you had something to uh, yeah. say about that? Yeah, Ron, there's, there's an easy way to do this. This is much less secure, but uh, you can use something called DMZ server. Okay. Well, that's a, yeah, that's a good point. And that's what, probably what you did when you said you made it accessible to the whole network. Or No, you wouldn't have done it that way, actually. That would be really dangerous. Right. Here's DMZ. Stands for demilitarized zone, which is probably yeah. not the best. But what it means is one computer, say in this case 109, has no firewall at all. It's wide open. That computer is on the net is, is completely naked on the network. It looks to the outside world as if, as if that computer is the computer at that uh, at your IP address. Right. Um, the drawback of doing that, and uh, the reason I wouldn't recommend that, is because it unblocks every port. Mm -hmm. That computer is now completely vulnerable. Usually, you only do that. If you uh, want to run a server on there, uh, webcam. You know, webcam. Yeah. Even then, if you knew what ports it was going to be using, I would I would recommend using port forwarding as opposed to DMZ. It's a little bit more finicky, but it's a lot more secure. Yeah, I just manually opened up the six ports I needed. Yeah, that's I think that's the best way to do. This is people get a little confused by all this. It's one of the reasons. Microsoft, this is what I thought you might say, Andy, turned on universal plug and play in routers. And the idea there is that a program like NetMeeting can converse with the router and say, please open these ports up for me. Now, that's nice for you as a user, Ron, because you don't even have to know that this transaction, in fact, you don't know this transaction happened. Right. However, it means that any hack tool on your system can do the same thing. Right. And that, <laughs> Anybody can get in. And that's very dangerous. So we went over here to universal plug and play forwarding, and I would disable that you know, for, uh, for, for the system because that is a very, very dangerous precedent. This is actually a little bit 
Now, I'm looking at this Linksys interface, and this is a little nicer because you can actually say which applications. For instance, FTP. Yeah. On it, my SMC, um, the UPMP is only effective on the messenger. Yeah, that's good. I like that. It's uh, only effective on MSM Messenger. Yeah, yeah. Because normally what I tell people is when you get a router, first thing you should do is change the password, not the default password. Second thing you should do is you turn off universal plug and play. It's such a danger. But if it says only Messenger, in this case, only FTP, that's not so bad. Yeah. Because then you're restricting it. You're not saying to uh, any hack tool can't just open it up. Right. Does that answer your, I mean, you, it sounds like you it solved does, the problem. It does more or less answer my question. Yeah. Unfortunately, my I don't know of any way to say... Uh, you know, make this easier. It's just I know NetMeeting, like Microsoft has discontinued NetMeeting yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. With uh, Messenger the newer versions it. of Longhorn coming out, there's not going to be in there. Right. But they've got the new one, Live Meeting. Oh, I don't know that. With the Office Pack. Oh, neat. And it's an Office add-on. So if you, you buy, buy Microsoft it. Office, you can use Light Meeting. Live. Live Meeting. Okay. Live Meeting. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I have seen that. Yeah. It's probably part of the SharePoint services. Right. Right. It's part of SharePoint. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm wondering if they're going to have the same problem. Absolutely. And what Microsoft's solution, by the way, is universal plug and play, a solution I don't like. And once again, Microsoft, I, I, they do it again and again, and it's really disappointing to me. They consistently make a choice in, in user convenience as opposed to user security. Mm -hmm. and it's 10 years now, Microsoft, uh, you know problems uh, because they made that same choice years ago in Windows as well. Well, I'm liking, I'm just learning how to use Macs, and I'm this new iChat. Yeah, it's great. Tiger. You'll have the same issue. You'll have to enter those port forwarding ports. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure with that, though, because with uh, the Tiger OS, it's supposed to use only the ports it needs, and iChat is embedded, so. Right. Well, that's where you really get in trouble with port forwarding is they use dynamic ports. Yeah. FTP is a, why this FTP you know, they say DMZ uh, FTP. It's because FTP it uses this uh, an outgoing port to establish the connection, but then a random port <laughs> for the for the conversation, and you don't know. So you have to unblock everything. Yeah. And so there, and and net meetings like that too. By the way, net meeting can is dynamic ports. That's a really bad choice. Yeah, that's uh, not why net you meeting have to have uh, six because you can use only the three. Right. But when you get into the desktop sharing, you need three right. extra. For it to jump between. Exactly. And Messenger's worse because Messenger is dynamic and can use any number of words. Ron, I thank you for the call. It's good to talk to you. It seems like you got it working pretty well here. Thanks for having me on again. You're, you're playing a great picture. I'm using cable. Yeah, it looks good. It's, it's amazingly because it's a really cheap camera. <laughs> you never know, do you? No. You never know. We're getting a great picture. Well, Ron, great to talk to you. Okay. Thanks for the call. Hope it's not too, too complicated for everybody, but it, it is something. But that you need to know, if you want to protect your network, routers are great, better than firewalls, software firewalls, but you do need to know a little bit about configuring them. It's a little harder than a software firewall. Anybody ever say, uh, say to you, hey baby, want a wiki? No, no, it's okay, don't worry. You don't need any pickup skills for this next one. If you can type, we're going to show you how to set up your very own wiki. Coming up next, I call for help. Well, besides being the Hawaiian word for fast, it's also an editable web page, Ollie. We uh, showed you Wiki, which is the encyclopedia everybody contributes to, or many people contribute to uh, previously. And now today, Amber's going to show you how you can do your very own Wiki. Yeah, I actually yeah. Uh, stumbled across this when I was doing some research for what is a Wiki and found Wikipedia. And then there was this article by Forbes magazine. I love Wikipedia. I do too. It's fantastic. It's gotten better and better. It's really, really good. So I um, found this company called Jotspot that's in California. And you had mentioned you'd heard of them as well. So I went and did a little bit of investigating. And it turns out that you can easily set up a Wiki on their site. It's all hosted. This is created by uh, Kraus, uh, Joe Kraus, the guy who started yeah. Excite. Excite, yeah, this exactly. This is his new venture. Yep. Yeah, and uh, so what they've done is they've figured figured out a way to make a really good model, an application wiki that you can go and you can set up, which is free right now, and eventually they'll be charging for it. Very cool. Um, this is mostly, I would think, 
for intranets, for corporate networks exactly. where they're going to collaborate. Ex we use a wiki internally at mm -hmm. Call for Help to collaborate on the production of the television show. Yeah, for and it's really good. I actually spoke to someone from Jotspot who was saying that a lot of people are using these to actually replace their intranets because intranets are a little bit clunky. And for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's basically an internal website right. where people post things. Well, this allows you to go that extra step and you can post things and you can also edit them and collaborate. Yeah. So it's really, in some ways, replacing email and the internet at the same time. Do we need to switch something on that? On, on uh, Amber's computer, is it because we're trying to get a picture of it and we're not getting the picture of it up here? All right, Mikey's going to press a button. Thanks, Mikey. He's magic. He's Look magic. at that. The magic fingers, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> of Mike. La -za 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 -za. All right. So um, what we're going to show here is we're going to actually show how to go in and create your own wiki. Okay. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Can I join this now, or is it is it open to the public now? Yeah, it's open to the public now. So again, it's called, it's jotspot.com. Okay. You can go there. It's so jot.com, right? Um, actually, it's jotspot.com, but the program's called Jot. You get a Jot account. So you go to jotspot.com to sign okay. up, um, and then and then when you get your wiki, exactly, it'll be, jot it'll be like we right now I've set up callforhelp.jot.com. So that's the name of our wiki. Um, so we've, I've gone in in here and set up. Um, home page for the wikis. I love wikis. I'm a wiki fanatic. I know. You've kind of got me hooked wikis. on them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have actually, I'm using this as well just Are for you? some friends and I, I know it's all. really fun. So as you can see, you can set up different pages in the wiki. Um, so this is the page. We're on the edit page and it's really it's a menu bar. It's just like Word or a word processing program. By the way, it requires Windows and Internet Explorer because of that. It needs to use ActiveX and Active Scripting. So Interesting. Yeah. Uh, So, <laughs> it's all right, Leo. So, basically, you can go in, you can set up all these pages. What I've done is I've created um, three new sections of the wiki, and I've used um, applications that they have in their applications gallery for free. So, they have a to do list application, they have an expense application, and a contact application, RSS applications. So, all these extra little applications that really plug into the wiki. That's so what you can add to about it. Jotspot comp compared to the wiki that we use is that these built in applications. Exactly. So, we'll look just quickly at the application gallery. So, these are look your choices these. of so different cool. applications, which I love. So so you can add a company directory to your wiki, an event calendar, a meeting manager, to-do list, now, all these different things. Now anybody can edit these or add to them, but you can also restrict how it, I mean, how do they control that? Exactly. So what you can do, I mean, anyone can edit them, but what you need to do if you don't want anyone to edit them is, as an administrator, you can set them up so only certain people oh, have okay. usernames passwords. and passwords. Yeah, so okay. it can be password protected. Right. So you can make sure there's only a certain number of people or certain right. people who actually enter and edit That's the wiki. That's what we do on our wiki, only people who who know Andy's middle name can edit all <laughs> Exactly. So, and then you can also <laughs> do things like you can attach files, you can CC all the wiki pages that you change in your email so they actually get sent to you via email. So cool. There's all these different things. You can spend tons of time going through it. So you can basically create pages, edit pages. It's really, really easy to do. This is free? Yeah, this is free right now, but they're start about to charge um, about $7.95 a month well, that's not for bad. users to come and use this. For nonprofits, it will be free oh, and you know the, it will go up from there depending on how many users you'll have. I've been using a wiki for my radio show for a long time where the people who listen to the radio show can modify mm -hmm. The, the stuff so that if they yeah. want to add to it, they can. And it's really worked out well. It's really fun. So anyone who's working on any kind of project, you know, if you Absolutely. were working with a bunch of people and starting a company, this is a great inexpensive way this. to get together and collaborate yeah. on ideas, post documents, and forget about email and just put thing online and it's all hosted by a job. This is the wave of the future, frankly, is online applications. Yeah. Instead of desktop applications, you install a CD onto your computer. The idea of an application that comes in over the internet and can be used by anybody. Different people. Very powerful. It's really good. Actually, he told me that some moms are using this for like their uh, children's uh, play groups. So they go in here and they collaborate right. and they discuss things and they post yeah. things. They have, have a, a blog. Yeah. There's blog applications and all that fun stuff. I like it. This yeah, is Jack. Bot. Yeah, Jotspot, and we'll put a link to it on uh, callforhelptv.com. Makes wiki easy. <laughs> For more information and wiki wisdom, we use uh, the wiki software we use is PM Wiki, by the way. P M W I K I. Very good stuff. Cool. Uh, but not as sophisticated, I'm afraid. <laughs> Visit callforhelptv.com. Uh, that's the show notes are right there. Uh, not in a wiki, I'm sorry to say. But more wonderful, webby, wacky stuff coming up right after this short break. Stay right here. <laughs> to call for help. Time for our Windows tip of the day from Leo's Technology Almanac. Yeah. We're going to show you how to change the Windows startup sound. All you have to do is click on this icon in your control panel, sounds and audio. 
click on sounds, scroll down until you get the start option towards the bottom of your screen, right there, and then go through one of their many lists of different sounds that you can choose from. I'm going to choose the aquarium default, so this is bubble, so you can just start up with that instead of the regular default, and then click apply. And now we have another caller. We have Brad on the webcam from Brandon, Manitoba. Is it Brad from Brandon or Brandon from Brad? Hello, Brad. How are you? Hi, Leo. How are you today? Let's see him up here like magic. <laughs> like magic. <laughs> hey, good to see you. Hi. What can I do for you today, Brad? Um, Leo, I recently something, bought a uh, new HP 8000 series notebook, and I want to. I use Outlook for my contacts and email, yes. and I currently have over 4,000 items in my inbox. Yeah, baby. And I wondered if that's going to be a problem down the road and if there's a, a free application out there that I can save and transfer it to my new laptop and not lose any of my contacts or my inbox. So let me, let me ask you what it is the, the, that you're worried about. Um, are you worried about the fact that you have so many things in there or are you just worried about being able to transfer them when the time comes? Well, no, I want to transfer them now, and I just wondered what I can use, but I just wondered, is there ever going to be a problem where it will, will be too, m too much information in my inbox? Oh, okay. So you have, those are the two different questions. Yeah. Um, no, first of all, um, I suppose there's a theoretical limit in Outlook to how big it can get, but 4,000? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's nothing. <laughs> nothing, Brad. Uh, I have hundreds of thousands of messages in mind. So, I mean, there is a theoretical limit. Maybe it's in the millions and trillions. I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. 4,000, you're a punter. You're not even close to being anywhere near uh, a problem, okay? Okay. So, uh, the next thing is how do we transfer it over? And that's very easy. I'm actually trying to get into it. You know, every time we rebuild these machines, um, I, I have to re go through this, this password uh, wizard again to kind of set up my uh, Outlook. So, let me just do this really quickly. Uh, I apologize to you. Okay. Um, but what I'm going to do is show you what Outlook does is it, set, it stores everything in a single file called Outlook.pst. Okay. So you have a couple of options, uh, a couple of things you can do. Now I'm in Outlook, finally. Uh, you want to uh, no. Okay, here we go. So there's a couple of things you can do. One is you can archive. And this, by the way, is a, is a way of responding to your first part of your question. You can always archive the uh, files that you have in a folder. Or, or in, you know, and, and a, a folder, by the way, is everything. It's your email, it's your, it's your contact information, it's everything. Okay. You can always, uh, 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 in that PST file, you can always archive that uh, if you choose. Is that when it asks me, yes. do you want to auto-archive right yeah. now, and it, you say yes? It's doing it automatically, but you, you might want to get into the archive per, you know, uh, settings here. Uh, let's go into properties for personal folders and uh, take a look here. Um, you might want to uh, go into the settings. Actually, you know, they, they've changed where it is now. Let's see. I guess it's not there anymore. I'm going to look for the archive settings here. Um, and you can tell it what the rules are for archiving. Okay. Um, and uh, I have to apologize. We haven't set this up uh, at, to the degree that I would have liked to, so I'm, I'm browsing around in here. Um, by the way, if you want to find this file, I might as well as long as I'm at this dialog box. This is, you know, you can see where the, where the, uh, the data file is um, and you can move it. it. You know, one way to do this is just to do a search for outlook.pst. That's right. the file where everything is stored. Okay. You may have multiple ones of those depending on how many versions of Outlook you've used for how long. Pick the one that's big. Okay. <laughs> the biggest and I one. Can just, I can save that and then just transfer it to yeah. the new Outlook that's empty? Right. Okay. And then what you'll do is you'll open Outlook and uh, you'll say, use which Outlook data file should I use? You go to the open menu and say, choose data file. And, and you can actually have multiple Outlook.pst files and each one will show up in the Outlook bar as a separate uh, file. And then you could say which one, that's where I was before, which one do I want to have mail saved to, that kind of thing. Okay, so theoretically I could have more than one inbox. You can have as many as you want. Okay. Uh, and just, you know, to keep track of them. And then when you, uh, when you go to this options uh, menu, uh, you, can, you, can say to, uh, you can say to it, um, let's go back here, this is, the, uh, this is where the email goes. Deliver new email to the following location. Now, I only have one folder, but you can have multiple, f multiple folders. And you say okay. which, one, which one the new email goes to. Okay. So the what the archiving does is it creates new PST files, archive.pst files, which you can keep open. 
okay. or close. But the new mail will go into the outlook.pst file, and I hope I'm not confusing you here, which right, you can right. move then from machine to machine as well. Okay. So it's flexible. Okay. There, there's a downside and there's an upside. It's nice because Outlook stores everything, contacts, address information, uh, email, uh, calendar, all in one big blob, outlook.pst. That's a risk because it's all in there. Right. And it gets to be a huge file, by the way. Yours, you know, 4,000, maybe not, but mine's over a gigabyte. Right. And so should I back that up? Well, Every once in a while? yeah, I would absolutely, okay. it, and that's the advantage. It's easy to back up, easy to move. It's all in there. Right, um, and all I would have to do is drag and drop it over to, to burn precisely. it. Precisely. Okay. Yep, just burn it. It's a regular file, okay. and you'll get everything. You get your filters. You get everything. Great. So that's that's the probably the, the that's the upside to having it all in one file. The downside is it's maybe a little more vulnerable, a little fragile. Right. So it's good to archive and back up regularly. Okay. Does that well, thank all make you. sense, I Brad? My wife and I watch your show uh, religiously, and we love it. And say hi to Amber and Andy. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Hi, Amber. Hi, Andy. Hi, Brad. <laughs> Thanks hi. a lot, Brad. Take okay, care. Okay, guys. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Most people write, edit, and publish their blogs using a web interface. Yeah. 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 But these methods don't include things like a spell checker and, nope. and all of the features that you're used to in your, in your uh, co computer. Entries can easily be lost if a page fails to load. I'm going the wrong way. Now I'm going to go this way. Mikey has a free file of the day to show us an easier way to blog using your desktop and all the features your desktop offers. Exactly. You know, how many times have people lost entries because a page failed to reload oh, or something worst. like that? You know, you spend an hour working on an entry, you put links, you put pictures, and... Oh. Ugh. <sighs> the pain. So, um, this is, a, this is a, a really simple one called Zoundry. Um, I haven't seen this one. Now, I use Ecto. I use Ecto. It's a paid program. Love. Um, I love it, too, for the Mac. Yeah. Um, and and it's Windows. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's also W uh, Blogger. W Blogger. Which That's I correct. use on Windows. Yeah. But this is a little lightweight free, freebie. It's, it's very light and freebie. And it also adds, it, it, unfortunately, not for Canadian or Australian residents, but for U.S. residents, they can uh, put affiliate links in there and make money off their blog. Oh. Which is nice. Doesn't support Amazon.ca? Uh, no. Oh. No, no, no. We got to talk to the guy. <laughs> But anyhow, with, with this, with this, at least with this one, it's very simply laid out. Um, it looks um, like a word processor. It's, it's word processor, basically bold, underline, italic, you know, I mean, all the no normal features, center, right, left, justify, kind of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very simple to put in there. Works type with away. Blogger, with uh, TypePad, typepad. And, and Atom uh, APIs, which oh, is most, most, almost everything. Almost then. everything, okay. yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Very cool, Zoundry. Yeah. I might have to look at that instead of Blogger. Hmm. Uh, if you want to know more about any free file, including this one, just go to callforhelptv.com. We've got links there. Coming up, if you have such terrible eyesight you can't use a computer, you'll want to check out Andy's next segment, zooming in on the text. But before we do that, let's give you a chance to test your tech knowledge. We have a little debate going on on this one. We'll accept two different answers. How about that? Which type of TV can be damaged from a burnt-in picture? LCD, CRT, plasma, or Etch-a-Sketch? Actually, I'm thinking three different answers, but you go to the website. No. I'll change the question. On. Which one cannot be burnt-in? Oh. Yeah, no. you've got, we'll talk about it. We'll debate this subject when we continue. <laughs> Stay right here. Before the break, we asked you which type of TV cannot I'm going to change it. All Cannot right. be damaged from a bird in picture. LCD, CRT, plasma, and etch a sketch. You were going to say plasma is the only one that can be. Yeah. But we've got a little argument actually over this because uh, the old CRTs certainly could. Modern CRTs don't have the problem. But anything with a phosphor where the the electron gun's hitting the phosphor. In theory, the phosphor could start to burn in is when the phosphor retains the image. So if you leave sure. the screen on the same thing for a long time, plasma is really bad that way. The only one that really cannot is LCD. Even an etch a sketch, you know, if you draw the same thing over and over again. All right, I'll give you Unbelievable. that. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. If you said, if you said plasma, you, you got that one right. And I'll give you extra a, po a point if you said CRT. Right. That means I get no points. Is we that were right? looking for plasma. All right. Andy is here with a, a, a program that your dad uses. Yes, this is a tribute to my father, Greg Walker. Uh, he is, uh, is he 62 years old? And he, he, for about the last 15 years or so, he's had a condition called macular degeneration. It's very common, unfortunately. Very common amongst older people. Yeah. He has actually got it when he was a younger man. It's pretty young, yeah. But essentially what happens is the macular is the central part of your, of your retina, right? And so what happens is you get black spots right in the middle of your vision. 
it's so like you have a hole in what you can see. It's a hole. It's like yeah, it's as if as if there's nothing there, and so you can see around it. So the, I'm going to show you a program that he uses. Uh, unfortunately, it's very expensive. It's something called Zoom Text, and it's in version 8.1 right now. It's a screen magnifier. It's a screen magnifier and reader, as, as it turns out. Now, out. don't send us notes. We know there's a built-in one in Windows, yeah. but he doesn't use that because it's so darn hard. It's hard to use. Yeah. Uh, this is this is makes. I mean, this is very very customizable, and it has incremental sizes and things like that. Well, wait till you see, folks. You'll see what we're talking so, about. It so really is amazing. What happens is you have a control bar at the top here. Um, um, and uh, this is going to be hidden, of course, but the, the, the fundamental use for this is this magnification thing, which you can actually go up in, in tiny little increments. So let me just turn it on, and you can see... We're at 1.2. 1 so depending on the degree of your uh, uh, of, eyesight of problem. Of your eyesight problem, right. And if you actually... Let's, let's pull up uh, a little effect here to show you what it would look like if you're looking at the screen. Um, it's coming up. This right is now. if you had macular degeneration. Right. You, you so, you, so you see this see this black spot here in your yeah. vision, and in fact that could be varying sizes. But as you go, as you make the the screen bigger, you can see around it. You basically. can see around it, and that's yeah. the idea: is that you know the top of a T and the, and the bottom of a of a, you know the bottom of the letter and the top of the letter you'll you'll see, but not the center, and that right. kind of idea. Right. But it goes all the way up to uh, look how big you sixteen. Get. You know what it's doing, which is very cool. Something called anti-aliasing. If you use the Microsoft magnifier, everything gets jaggy. And it's hard to read, but this actually is smoothing the text as it's zooming in, so it still looks really good. Now, even if this visual cue doesn't ha is, isn't perfect, it's not perfect, you're not going to always read everything. So it actually has a, and this is a very powerful piece of the equipment, uh, or the software is uh, something called a, a reader. And there's this new, these two new features called uh, App Reader and Doc Reader. So I have a Microsoft Word uh, document up here, and I'm going to turn up the App Reader on. Fiction and actual innovation. And, uh, the book suggests that the dream of the future. Oops, let me just, uh, oops, I'm going to get out of it for a second, maximize my screen here, and we'll put it back on. Oops. <laughs> Your dad is really good my at this. My dad is really good at this, and I'm not, <laughs> he, spent, he spent an hour with me uh, the other day showing me how to do it, and of course he's like Mr., it has lots of hotkeys on it. I think that's the key, is you, you have to customize it to fit your needs. That's right. Yeah. I want to say no. Uh, uh, I've messed it all up. <laughs> <laughs> it, anyway. So this is where, see, if you have macular degeneration, you can really be a lot better <laughs> than, right, your kids, than your kids. And they're going, well, I can't figure it out. You say, well, let me take care of that. That's right. And that's essentially what he did, he did the other day oh, when wow. we were having, I had a couple of glasses how, of wine. How much is it, just me. out of curiosity? It's uh, $695, so $595 You may US. well be able to get help from a local agency. Uh, that, that or is the correct. government if you're going to buy this. So. Here, here in Canada, employers will subsidize the cost right. of this. Uh, some of the provinces will. I don't right. know about Australia, but I suspect... Uh, almost, almost sure. Every, in every country, uh, if you have that kind of uh, disability, it's easy, not easy, but it's possible to get help on, uh, on buying this kind of adaptive technology. That's, right. that's what's so great about computers. They can be used to help people surmount any difficulty almost. Right. For more information about Zoom Text, who's that by? What's the company? It's called uh, AI Squared. AI Squared. Check out the show notes, callforhelptv.com. If there's a topic you'd like Andy to cover on a future show, send him an email. Yes, he's already answered his dad's email, so you get to send him none now. Andy at callforhelptv.com. We'll wrap up the show and give you some final thoughts when we get to continue right after this. Stay here. Welcome back to a Call for Help. Andy finally got that thing working, but it's too late now. It's too late it's now. Over. Sorry, Dad. Nice, <laughs> nice try. Nice try. It's really cool. You can download a free 30-day trial. Oh, well, that's AI good. AISquared.com. Check it out. Oh, that's good. Hey, if you want to join us on the show, go to the website, callforhelptv.com. Click that link, fill out the form. We'd love to have you here. If you've got a problem with your personal confuser, don't whine, moan, or yell. Just call for help. Call for help. See you later. Bye. <laughs>